Hello, so today I'm going to be talking about um, Androgyne the Third. that's my work of art, and the artist that I, um, I'm going to be focusing on is Magdalena um, Abakanovic. I looked it up, so I hope I pronounced that right. Um, now, to begin a little bit about um, Abakanovic, she was born in Poland in 1930 um, in a rural estate about 200 miles um, east of Warsaw, so it was a pretty rural area, um, but she was born to a very aristocratic family. She was born with wealth, um, and as a kid, she was very interested in um, the Polish forest in her backyard, um, and there's a lot of mystery in that to her, which she tied into a lot of her work of art, um, especially Abakins, which is a um, sculptural collection of hers. Um, but her estate was invaded by the Nazis at age nine, which is when her mother was um, shot, which we're going to get into in a little bit. Um, but she was forced to flee by the Russians in 1944, so it wasn't until five years later that her family was forced to move to Warsaw. Um, and they lost all social identity that they had. Their prestige, money, and, um, was all gone as a family. Um, and her comfort as an artist was gone. She talked about in a lot of interviews that she no longer had that comfort of wealth. Um, now there was pressure of her to make it um, as an artist. And educationally, her background was the Warsaw Academy of Fine Arts. Um, and at the um, Academy of Fine Arts, what they taught her was um, social realism was the big movement of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, pretty much all throughout the communist regime. Um, and because that was what she was taught, as any great artist, that's exactly what she avoided. Um, she was very avant-garde, but she did have to do a lot of it for her schooling, but she really hated it. Um, and this is an example of it right here. I can't read Polish, but um, social realism, just like the five-year plan, um, constructivist um, definitely um, used it a lot. It was all about portraying workers in the best way possible. It was propaganda for communism, basically. Um, and even though the political and social conditions were horrible at the time, the cultural arts flourished um, in Stalin's Poland and afterward. Um, but as a result of World War II, the Nazis burned Warsaw to the ground, so it was about building everything up. Almost everything was new, um, which gave artists a lot of opportunity at that time. Um, when Stalin took over, um, it was all about communism and social realism, and it was a bunch of stolen elections um, to keep the power in, um, confined to uh, several groups of men. Um, until 1989, which is when um, communism fell. Um, now a little bit into her form, um, she, her typical um, materials were um, fabric and tapestry, um, but that's what she used in a Balkans, um, and she made them meticulously and then detached them on loom and then dyed them. Um, but in uh, Androgyne the Third, she um, used burlap, um, resin, wood, nails, and um, string. Um, and it was seated, unlike um, her other sculptures, this was seated um, on low stretchers of wood. Most of the others were um, um, either upright. Um, this one's almost prostrate, but like with her shoulders up. Um, the reason that's significant is because it's probably implying that she is um, not she, it's androgynous. So he or she is um, on hospital stretchers because they were injured most likely. And that's also what the um, poles in the bottom, the wood logs in the bottom could represent are um, legs that are no longer, that no longer belong to them. Um, what's very interesting about this work of art is the musculature, as abstract as it is, it doesn't really show much, kind of like um, the Kiss um, sculpture. Um, the musculature, the veins and the backbones are very defined. Um, and the interior, if you look, I don't have it, but if you look on the other side, kind of the stomach, it's hollow. But in her opinion, the space is mass itself. It's not wasted art. Um, so that's another really important part of Andrew the Third. Um, and in order to learn about um, this work of art, you need to look at her other works of art. And Abakins is really big. Um, it's kind of what gave her a big break. She worked, started in the 60s. Um, it's a monumental um, collection of fiber sculptures. Um, and it was all about nature and clothing that was not functional. Um, a lot of them hung from the ceiling. A lot of them were humans. A lot of them were other um, abstract naturalistic works. Um, and that's what referred to the forest near her home. Um, now, in both um, Androgyne III and in Abakins, what was really big was the obsession with the body. And the reason she, um, she actually did a lot of studying of the human body. She did dissection visits at the morgue and at the hospital. She really studied the body in order to make the sculptures as not accurate as possible, but to understand them as much as possible so that she could um, kind of convert that energy into her art. And something that's really important with this work of art is that it is androgynous because she wanted to focus on the humanity, not the sexuality of um, the sculpture. And um, what's big about this work of art is that it depicts trauma, fix her trauma and a lot of the other poles at the time, um, which she experienced from two separate events. Um, her mother's volunteer work in the, ho um, her volunteer work in the hospitals, um, but also her, when the Nazis invaded her home when she was nine, her mother's arm was shot off um, in, the, in her kitchen and she witnessed that. And that was very traumatic for her and a lot of her um, experiences thereafter. 
Now, the intention behind this work of art was to depict the brutality of war. You know, she witnessed a lot of World War II, and not just that. I mean, aside from World War II, there was still a lot of violence going on in the Soviet Union, especially in Warsaw, um, during the Soviet reign, um, especially after Stalin. Um, and a lot of it, the words that she used in her interviews was the memory of trauma. That was really big for her, um, because aside from her, it resonated with a lot of the other Polish people. Um, it's an expression of suffering and disturbance because um, it's the the person is most likely on stretchers because they're wounded. They're most likely legless. That's why it's not portrayed. Um, and what was really big is uh, at this time in the 50s, 60s, this was um, later this in the 70s, but was dis destruction and creation. That was really big um, because Warsaw was burned to the ground and then they're building everything up. So that's this work of art definitely shows a lot. Um, and it wrangles with the inevitability of war, you know, it's, war's been going on in Poland for so, even after World War II, pretty much, not active war, but, um, you know, the Cold War, there, it, it was very passive in Poland, but there were still many, um, uh, rebellions happening, so, um, that was really important for her to portray in this work of art as well, and also the human imagination with na within nature, um, she didn't want to give this a gender, she didn't want to give many depictions, she wanted, um, the actual um, viewer to interpret this as much as she can. So I thought this work of art was really cool. I thought um, Abakanovich was really cool. Um, and I hope that I did it justice.